Hello, everybody. My name is Lorraine O'Donnell, and I'm Education and Outreach Officer with Inland Fisheries Ireland. And I'd like to welcome you all here today to our webinar on barriers to fish migration in Ireland. Today we celebrate um, World Fish Migration Day. So we're delighted that you could all give up your busy Saturdays to join us and to learn more about what's happening in Ireland and some case studies. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Brian Coughlin. So Brian Coughlin is a research officer here with us in Inland Fisheries Ireland, and he's working on our various program. And he's been working on it for a number of years. So um, I'll hand you over to Brian and there's an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. And also um, we're going to record the session because a lot of people have asked us about that. So it'll be available later on um, on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Um, we are in our second cycle now. So we were initially 2018 to 2021. We're now 2022 to 2025. We're sort of aligning with the river basin management plans. So I'd like to, first off, I'd like to thank the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage for um, funding us, for funding this programme. And also, especially, I'd like to thank all the IFI staff around the country who have assisted us and helped us in our barrier assessments throughout the country. They've been a, a great help a great help and I'll show you how they're helping us later in the program. Um, so barriers to fish migration. I like this um, video that's running on slide that's running at the start here. This is your the weir in Athlone and it gives you a good idea what fish face in terms of the migration. This is on the Shannon and as you can see here it's a very small fish pass for a very big river and it's broken. Um, so on that note, I'll continue on. So a little introduction to the World Fish Migration Day. Um, these, the World Fish Migration, the idea is that it's connecting fish, river and people. And I think this is a really, it, it's an immensely important thing. Um, because, you know, I think a lot of this, people have forgotten about, you know, how important migrate, the, the river is to migratory fish and, you know, and how it all connects together. And people can connect to fish where it's quite hard to connect to rivers. And as you can see there, in a recent study, 1.2 million in-stream barriers were detected throughout Europe. And 68% of these structures are less than two meters in height. So a lot of people are fixated with dams and reservoirs and really big things. But in reality, most of our problems are quite small. And, and if you look at it even more in depth, most of our problems are actually culverts and bridges. That we have not a huge amount, in, especially in Ireland, we, we don't have a huge amount of like weirs and reservoirs and dams, but we have an awful lot of culverts and bridge crossings and bridge aprons and fords. And that's where our connectivity is being really impacted. So I was at the EPA water conference last week and I'm a scientist, I'm not really a philosopher, but the journalist who was there, Ella McSweeney, she said something that sort of resounded with me. She said, water is a truth teller, sort of, it's a whistleblower of our misdemeanors. So like if we do something bad in the environment, like the water will tell you, you know, if you pollute the river, you'll detect it in the river. If you modify the river or you know, it impact on the river, you can see the ramifications either in the water itself or in the fish species that live there. So you know, this, is, this is an important thing to think about in terms of like, how we interact with the landscape and how we, how we modify the landscape for our own interests, really not considering like, other, other species that are important in it and that are important to us in it. So, and the last slide I think is very import important. It's like it's the veins and arteries of the world. These are everywhere and they're very important to us. And as you know, climate change is happening, climate crisis is happening, climate anxiety is happening. You know, we have to plan ahead and we have to be ahead of the curve. And as I said to one of my colleagues, I said, when's the best time to plant a tree? It was about 20 years ago. So we need to start thinking about this now. How do we protect our rivers going forward into the future? So I'm gonna hang my coat uh, on this poster from the American rivers, three rivers, they work better. So rivers that aren't impacted by dams and reservoirs and culverts and flow unimpacted from the source to the sea, they're better. They're more resilient and more resistant to change. And the species that are in them are more resilient and resistant to change so that they can, you know, if, if some sort of catastrophe happens, they can bounce back, they have better bounce back ability. And you know, they just have better capacity to cope with change. So this presentation, I'm going to talk about the barrier effects, the species involved, the drivers for change, who, who is driving change, the barrier types we find in Ireland, 
the barrier assessment in Ireland, some of the stuff that we can do, really physically go out there and do under certain circumstances, certain, certain you know, you know, we can't have it our own way. Like we have to inter it's a human, it's a human landscape. We have to, you know, interact with humans. And in the future, where can we go? So what do barriers to fish passage look like? Um, well, this is the impacts of structure. See two images here. We have a free flowing river at the top. You can see here, no, nothing impacting from the, the headwaters to the sea and a dammed river at the bottom. So in a free flowing river, everything progresses uninterrupted from the source to the sea. So you have free transport of sediment, debris and nutrients they come down the system. Naturally turbid flows, so you get in certain in parts of the river, you have the riffle pool glide sequence that all anglers know and love. And this turns over nutrients, it frees up gravel, it transports material, it transports the gravel downstream. And that creates spawning habitat. You have a natural temperature regime, like you know, the river temperatures as it, as it should be. It's not overly exposed to thermal radiation. You don't have like you know thermal inputs from business or industry. And um, you know, it's it's actually what the the, yeah, the the fish and the aquatic invert the aquatic animals have adapted or evolved to to function in. So this is what you want. And obviously, at the end there, you have free passage for aquatic organisms. And one of the terms that the Water Framework Directive, and like I'm very cognizant of the Water Framework Directive because that's the biggest show in town. There's a word they use, it's called hydromorphology. And it looks at the way the river, the natural progression of it, the natural way it flows and how like the organisms in it, like the plants and the trees and how they all interact to create a natural system. Like all these things have a natural pull and push and pull in a river. And that's called hydromorphology, like how a, how natural woody woody habitat will you know scour and deposit how riverbanks erode how all these things they come under hydromorphology and the more natural a system is the, the natural more natural the hydromorphology is probably again the more resilient and resistant the the river is and the fish species in it are to change in terms of climate change or in terms of like the the, the catastrophic catastrophic impact maybe of a pollution event you know with more natural hydromorphology the fish species or the aquatic invertebrates bounce back better. So in the bottom then, in a dammed river, you can replace dam there with weir, you can replace it with culvert, you can replace it with slu you know, sluice, you can replace it with all sorts of things. So in a, in a, in a dammed river, well, it's, it's changed utterly. You've, got, you've gone from a river system, in reality, to a lake system. You've gone from lentic to lotic. And what does that mean? Well, at the top of the where the, the impoundment starts, you've got mass sedimentation. So a healthy substrate will be buried. As the, as the river slows down into the, into the, in the impounded section, it will deposit silt, silt and sediment. And that can create problems. It can create like, you know, a sink for nutrients. And that can create an algal blooms in these impounded sections. You have obviously a uniform flow as the river slows down into this artificial lake. Um, the impounded sediment that can create like, you know, excess algal growth, excess um, in-stream vegetational growth. You've got an altered temperature, re temperature regime here. As you can see, I've drawn this line here. It's called a thermocline. It's where the water separates between very hot and very cool at the bottom. And that's not natural in a, in a natural flowing, in a natural sort of naturally turbid river. That doesn't, doesn't happen. So you can have a very, very hot layer of water on the top of, of, the, of the river because it's, you know, it's been heated up because all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's gone from a river to a lake, you know, there's more heat and more surface area to heat up. It's flowing slower, so the residence time is longer. Um, obviously, passage is impacted. Fish and organisms can't get up or down. It's important to consider down. Down is very, very important when you think about things going to sea, salmon, sea trout, eels. You have to consider down. It's, it, it's a new, it's one of the newest sciences in terms of fish passage, but it's incredibly important. These things can be a hazard in terms of People drown in weirs and um, they're falling down, a lot of them, little maintenance, I've got some slides later. And the riverbed down degrades downstream. It's important to note as you're at the top of the impoundment, you can have a lot of sedimentation. It captures a lot of sediment in terms of your gravels, your sands, your sails, it captures everything. And they don't progress through the impounded zone. So downstream of the dam, what you can have is the river is starved of sediment, starved of. Of, you know, mostly that the, the larger stuff, your cobble, your gravel. So 
downstream of the river, you might find that there's very poor like salmon or trout spawning or sea lamprey spawning. So, you know, it, it, it's affecting everything. It's affecting sediment supply, water temperatures, fish passage. You know, it's really affecting all those hydro, that, that sort of hydromorphology again. And hydromorphology affects water framework directive score, as we do as do the, the fish species that you can find. And if you talk about the fish species, like this is a natural, it's in an Irish river system, you've got like brown trout, salmon, sea trout, eels, um, and a couple of other nat sort of naturalized species. In the impounded section, what you can have is very few of our na native species, and a sort of like a lot more of our naturalized species, such as bream and um, and eel and well, bream and perch and other things. Basically, it's a lake system, so the, the species will record, will, will uh, sort of take advantage of that. So fish passage and migration, I'd like this slide here really is about, it's not just migratory fish that need to move. If you look here, like every fish species have like different parts of their life cycle. You've got like, you know, juveniles, spawning, nursery, feeding areas, and the fish have to m migrate between that. An idea with that would be like, if you look at um, like bream in the Shannon, like before um, the sort of the navigation locks were built, and Bream and the Shannon may have migrated from Killaloo all the way up to Loch Arrow. But they can't now because there's a series of large weirs that are in the way that are impassable to them. So, like, you know, has that affected their like their feeding habit, their, their feeding migrations, their you know, the spawning migrations? You know, these things are they're impacting, they're, they're being impacted. And then in, you know, this is the freshwater movement, and obviously everybody knows Atlantic salmon and sea trout in terms of their migration to sea to feed and then they migrate back in to spawn and reproduce. And the same with sea lamprey. Um, people don't really talk about sh the shads in Ireland. They're in, S they're, they're in the SACs, in the Barrow of the Noor. Um, they're a habitat species, habitats directive species, and they're not very good at passing weirs. So, um, you know, they're, they're impacted quite significantly as well for their spawning migrations. So implications of barriers for fish. Uh, the fish might not even be able to get to where they're going. They may not be able to arrive at their spawning locations. And this may be an intermittent thing. So, you know, it's all down to water levels. So one winter you might have large amount of water. One winter you don't have enough water. So salmon may or may not, trout may or may not get to where they need to go to do their spawning to the optimal, feet, the optimal spawning grounds. Um, the higher up into a catchment, a lot of the time, the further from, you know, uh, sort of like pollution, the cleaner the rivers are, that's where you need your fish to be. That's where you need your, your salmon to be. That's where your, your species that are, are really intolerant of poor water quality or poor hydromorphology. You need to get them to the best habitat, to the best spawning grounds, so that they can spawn effectively, efficiently, create as many um, offspring as they can to you know, increase the numbers of, our, the num numbers of, the, of the fish. In other case, you have multiple barriers in sequence. So you've got like say something like the Liffey, where you've got 15 or 16 structures in the way before they get to their spawning grounds. And that's a compound effect. And that affects going up and the juveniles coming down. I'll talk about that in a bit. The red items here, I have uh, more slides. Physical damage. Personally, I found dead salmon below a weir on the dodder as a, as a young angler. Um, five or six pound salmon just didn't make it because he was trying to get up over a weir and uh, just you know, just died because of the injuries. Uh, these create uh, weirs and dams can create exposure to predators and poachers in terms of fishes upstream and downstream movements and downstream, downstream smolts and um, both sea trout and salmon can be predated above weirs as they wait for a flush of a fresh to push them over the weir. Example here in the bottom corner, that's an adult salmon that has spawned in March migrating downstream to sea. And as you can see here, he's got a bit of fungus on him. And he needs to get to sea before that kills him. And the salt water will sort of uh, sort of help with the, the sort of mitigation of that fungus. But he was stuck above a weir in the Kells Blackwater or in the, uh, the Munster Blackwater. So exposure to low flow, high temperatures, weirs will do this to the migrating fish and native fish. Lots of energy and condition. They can spend a lot of time trying to get over weirs, weeks. You know, energy they don't need to spend on you know uh, loss of eggs and milk in terms of they can you know they, they, they lose all their energy trying to get upstream to spawn instead of actually generating gametes 
generate, generating eggs and milk. You can have habitat loss. If you build a weir in a river, you impound two kilometers of it. You may have had really good spawning and nursery uh, sort of water where the weir is impounding. That's gone. And as I talked about earlier, impacted hydromorphological processes, which is with like the natural progression of sediment downstream through the system, where you turn, like, say, a the river from a lake from a river into a lake. So it's an example of the compound effect of structures. This is from a single channel, the, the Black Water Dillon down in Kilmacow. Um, it's a sea trout system. So if you have your sea trout down here at sea, they have to go one, two three, four, five, six, seven structures before they can get up to their spawning grounds in the headwaters. And conversely, their, their offspring, their, the, the migrating sea trout smolts, have to get down over all these structures before they can get to sea and uh, start feeding up before they migrate back as adults. But again, the, nat the, the native or natal brown trout have to deal with these as well on their spawning migrations. So. This has a cumulative effect over time. It can affect the genetics of a population. It can affect basically their overall success as a species in this system. And if you find if one of these structures was really impactful, you might have genetic differences between upstream and downstream populations. And that can in itself can cause problems, especially if we've built it, if it's, it's not a natural system, a natural, not a natural barrier, sorry. Um, exposure to poachers and predators this is a nice example in America. You've got pelicans down below eating the upstream migrants and pelicans above, or pelicans below eating the upstream migrants and pelicans above eating the downstream migrants. So your, your small fish coming downstream are being eaten up here and your bigger adults trying to migrate upstream are being eaten down here. So it is a problem. And you will find in Ireland that sometimes you'll notice cormorants around the top of weirs as the you know, as, as fish are trying to migrate up and downstream and they're caught up above or below weirs. And some of our best fisheries are below uh, sort of man-made structures. Just putting it out there. Um, this is an example of the effect these structures have on the thermal regime of a river. This is an example from the Kells Blackwater. It's a tributary of the Boyne. They would say that it was in July 2018. And what we did is we had um, temperature probes in the river immediately upstream of the impounded section of the river and at the bottom of the weir. So the example here, this is at Headford. We had a temperature probe down here, right at the foot of the weir, and we had a temperature probe all the way up here where the, the start of the impoundment from the weir was. And we compared the two temperatures. And as you can see here, this is A, it's uh, at Hedford, there was 11 hectares impounded. B, at Virginia, there was 4.1 hectares impounded. And C, on a Minotti, a Minotti which is a trib of the Kalsbacher, only 0.5 of a hectare was impounded. And over here, we have the results. The blue line is upstream, the upstream temperature. The temperature as the water came into the impoundment. And the red is the temperature as the water left the impoundment. The important thing to note is this thin red line here goes through the graph. That's the upper thermal limit from, for trout. So that's a point where trout are no longer happy in the river. They are now into survival mode. So they're no longer growing. They're no, not, no longer sort of um, functioning properly as a, they're a cold water species. Above 19.1 degrees, they're into survival mode. So they're not going to do very well. So as you can see, on a very hot, very dry, low water event in July 2018, the water coming out of the weir at Hedford was always above that 19.1, while the water coming into the, into the weir was showing a you know, daily variation, going up and down, up and down. And at some point in the day, water was, was cool enough um, for them to, to at least feed and to you know, get, get, get doing what normal trout do when they're not under serious thermal stress. And as you can see here, as the, as the impoundment gets smaller, that red line Get, becomes more and more natural. So if you look at this, basically, if you've got a really big impoundment where the water takes a long time to get through and it's very shallow, you know, you've got it, you may have a significant thermal problem downstream of the weir where trout may just have to completely avoid the area. And that can affect, you know, upstream migration of fish as well because it's a thermal barrier. So the fish swimming up this channel at, at say, Headford, they might come up here and they might just go, that's too warm for me. I can't, 
I can't get over this structure during the summer months and I'll have to drop away back down. So you know, that's that's a big problem. It's also in the lake itself, you know, it can be very, very warm. So the fish will have to leave, leave that area. So some of the drivers are changed that we're finding. The water framework direction I've mentioned before is a quoting, the continuity of the river is not disturbed so that there's a flow from the top, from the, the headwaters to the estuary. You know, there's no disruption. That's the that's the perfect situation. Undisturbed migration of aquatic organisms or aquatic organisms and sediment transport. So the aquatic organisms can get upstream and downstream, and the sediment transport can just happen. So you've got gravel moving undisturbed through the system. The habitats directive, we're obliged to maintain or restore the natural habitats, eels regulation. And then at the very bottom there, you can see the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030. So this has just come out and they're looking to bring nature back into our lives. So they're across Europe, they're hoping to free up 25,000 kilometers of free flowing rivers by 2030. So this is one of our goals in terms of IFI National Barrier Programme, try to identify, prioritize, and uh, get after sort of to get our quota of that. And we have we have some we have stuff in motion to do this. Um, some of the types of barriers in, in Ireland, you can see here were wide and varied. When I took up the barrier program, I looked at the structures we had in our database or in our Excel sheet. I think it was like 25 different types of structure that was listed off. It was it was a it was a it was a bit of a mess. So we had to, you know, specific, you know, break these down into easy to identify um it's sort of like items into, into structures that we could class together so that we can assess them more efficiently and effectively. So we were working with the Amber Group and we decided that we'd break it down into five different artificial and man-made stuff and natural stuff. So the natural stuff stuff we no longer interfere with. These are natural river physical forms and um, they improve with biodiversity, genetic diversity and biosecurity. So in some of these situations in this weir here, no fish are going to migrate upstream of that. And um, you can find that there is genetically isolated, unique populations upstream of this, this, this river, this, this natural waterfall. We're not going to modify that in any way to aid in fish passage. That is there as it is. That's natural. And uh, it's the way it is. The artificial or man-made stuff, we've broken it down into five different items. Dams, which are obvious. Culverts, which are bridges, anything that crosses the river. Weirs, fords and sluices. And I've got some examples for you here. We have dams. Luckily, we don't have too many of them in Ireland. They block flow, forming a reservoir, usually for electricity or supply of water. This is the lit, this is the Shannon and the Bartry. You can see they're big structures. Thankfully, we don't have too many. Culverts, this is what we have a lot of. You can see here, downstream of bridges, anything that allows the river to flow through or under. This is a bridge in Wicklow. This is actually being mitigated this year, hopefully. And why does this happen? So no one builds a bridge to have a drop off the back because it's an engineering problem. But streams change over time. And if you don't install the bridge properly or the culvert properly, initially, this is what happened. This, this culvert here was probably put in two too close to the riverbed top and probably wasn't, si wasn't sized a fit properly. So over time, the river charging through it in flood events would have eroded out behind it and created this big drop. And that's where you, you get that. The river changes over time. So when you're stuck, when you're, when you're putting a culvert in, in, in now you're, you're trying to really make sure that you, you've basically managed against this change. You can more examples of culverts. I like this one here. This is why an improperly shaped or sized culvert is a problem. You can see the fish just getting blown off the, the, out of the culvert. So you're trying to swim up. So that culvert is not deep enough, very deep enough into the channel and the velocity is just too great for the fish. It's just getting washed away. Um, a lot of them, this one here, this is just inappropriate. They just put it too high, it's perched. These ones are too small. There's a huge blowout downstream and uh, yeah, it's the wrong shape, the wrong size. <coughs> Weirs, um, slow, stabilizing the riverbed or stream. This is Athlone. Um, as you can see, it's not, this was built a long time ago, over a hundred years ago. This is the fish pass, the very big river, the very small fish pass. This is no longer, um, this is no, long, no longer a best practice, as you would say. This is a weir on the, 
the Monalty. As you can see, there's fish trying to get over. It's not a very big weir, but its shape makes it a great, you know, it makes serious problems for fish, fish passage. Very little water on the, on the face of the weir, no downstream pool for jumping at the weir. They're forced to swim through this turbulent water to try to jump up onto it. And passage is very difficult for them. Um, and this is one of the problems. Adult salmon, the bigger fish, they will always try for the most attractive flow. This is where the flow attraction is to here. They'll swim up through this. Sea trout, trout on the other hand, might try at this corner and make passage. So, you know, so you'll find that some of these structures will affect more species than others. And in some sort of situations, you'll find that some sort of like larger fish are more affected than smaller fish. So, you know, it, they can have varied and different, in, different impacts to not only to different fish species, but to the fish species itself in terms of size passage. And um, more example of weirs. These are examples of stuff that's breaking over time. This is on the Boyne. As you can see here, there's two breaches in the weir face. This water coming through here is, there, is now not going over the fish pass. And that's a problem. As the weirs start to degrade, water is taken from the fish passes, which makes it even harder for fish to pass. <coughs> we have fords, which is for crossing by vehicle or foot. As you can see, fish don't like swimming through pipes with high velo velocity water in them. So it's a problem. And sluices, usually for water levels, these are on the Shannon mostly or the Barrow or our navigable waterways. And they should have fish passes in them, but in a lot of cases they're from the turn of the century. Uh, so to understand the barrier effect, you must uh, think like a fish. I love that. And, un and understand their limitations. Not every fish is a salmonid. These guys here are amazing jumpers, amazing swimmers. They get through, you know, the, what is it? There's a, there's a record jump of like over three meters for a salmon in Scotland. Like, but that's the Usain boat of the salmon world. What we have to do is provide fish passage for these guys who can't jump like that, can't swim like that. So to be water framework compliant, we have to make passage for eels. To be habitats directive compliant, we have to make passage for, for, for shad who don't like jumping. And we have to make passage for river and sea lamprey who, you know, they're just not very good jumpers. So I'll show you what, when does it become a fish? When does the structure become a barrier? When the hydraulic head or the jump height the fish has to go over to get upstream is greater than 0.1. So that's not very much. At that point, the, the passage of the fish is being impacted. You know, so they're like, you know, it's not, they may be able to get over it, but it's going to slow them down. They're going to be, they're going to have to stop for a second and say, there is something here. I'm going to have to jump over it. This is a modified environment for them. If the barrier is less, if the water depth on a barrier is less than 0.1. And if you think about that, if the water flowing over a barrier is less than 0.1 and you're a 20 pound salmon, you won't have enough water under your belly to actually swim through this structure. You'll sort of swim up and go fall over and get washed off. So that's where that comes into play. And if the effective length is greater than 10 meters, like I showed you the image of the, uh, the culvert where the water was coming through, like that's piling through incredibly quick, very shallow. If that's 10 meters in length, even a large salmon will get exhausted before he reaches the end of it and just get washed back out again. So we have to be mindful of not just the adult fish, but the juvenile fish. And we have to be mindful of other species of interest, such as the lampreys and salmon and shad. So any problems here for fish, unlike this one, this is on the Kells Blackwater. This is upstream of uh, Kells, it's, or upstream of Navin. Um, and it's a fish pass, but there's high velocity. There's a jump in it. There's high turbulence. And as I noted at the bottom there, a lot of fish pass solutions are based on designs created for adult salmon. So if you look here, an adult salmon will make passage on that. He might be affected a little bit. He'll have to work at it, but he'll make passage on that. What about the juvenile salmon? If they decided to, well, you know, they want to spread upstream. I don't think so. There's a lot of discharge there. There's an awful lot of turbulence. There's an awful lot of heavy water. And as for these guys, they're not going to make passage through that. That's not designed for them. That's just designed for adult salmon. Any problems here? It's a bridge apron. This is down in Kerry. Um, obviously, someone thought that it was a problem for fish passage. This, what happened was they built the bridge and they built this long sloping bridge apron downstream from it. Very shallow water, high velocity. So obviously, at some point said, 
somebody went, that's a problem for fish passage. So what we do is we build this into the face of the, 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 the bridge or the culvert face. It doesn't make it much better because again, water depth is less than 0.1 and velocities are very high. So will any of these make passage on that? Well, adult salmon maybe get up through here, but as for the rest of them, no. So you've got to think about, uh, you know, what, you know, for everybody in the, all the fish species in the population. Again, this is a culvert in the Midlands. This is a very average structure that you'll find out there. There's a drop off the apron at the end of the culvert and then very shallow skinny water all the way up through the culvert. So as for all of these, that's a real problem because first off, you have to jump onto it, which these guys don't do. Then you've got to swim over this really shallow, shallow water, which these bigger guys will have a problem with and they'll struggle with. So you have to think like a fish in terms of looking at these stuff and, and, and seeing that it is a problem. And saying that like, you know, high levels of, you know, in, in the winter, they get over it. But in the, if you look at that in the winter, there's going to be water, a lot of water coming through this high, high velocity on the bridge apron and probably large amounts of turbulence down here. So still, when there's more water on it, doesn't mean it's better for passage. It might be actually be as problematic for them. So some of the mitigation strategies that we can have, you can see here, we've got design guidance for fish passage on small barriers. This was produced by the OPW last year. This looking at bridge aprons, culverts, and um, how to mitigate them, how to make them better for fish passage. And we have some guidelines, IFI have some guidelines, guidelines for working and in, in installing culverts, which is important to make sure they're, they're going right. And in terms of mitigations, dam removal or weir mitigation occurs within a cultural context. That's in, weir, so mitigation action is in here and that's constrained by engineering, the river form and function, the hydrology of the river, how the river is flowing and the ecology. So, and the hydromorphology. So everything, in, you know, the mitigation is constrained. And then we have to work inside these further constraints, historical, legal, social, and economic constraints, which all, you know, have their effect and create, you know, it, it takes time to mitigate structures because they're in a human landscape and they affect people. And we have to be aware of this. And then we have to prioritize which ones we want to work at to get maximized money. The, you know, the, the pot isn't overflowing. You know, we only have a certain amount of money we can deal with and we need to be strategic in which structures we deal with. So we need to get the information needed and we have options reports and all these things. We need to get the funding. We need to find out who owns them. This is a big problem in Ireland. Who owns the structure? A lot of times we don't know. We have to find out before we do anything. And then in the legal context, you know, the constraints of the site, you know, is there, you know, will our mitigation of one thing of the weir affect bridges downstream, upstream? You know, these are, these are things to be mindful of. And this is why in the real world, it takes an awful lot of time. Some examples of our preferred mitigation options. Removal, just take it out. Brilliant. No fish passage issues. And a uh, fish, you know, uh, what is it? A guy I met in, in a, one of these conferences, he said, the worst image you can have to show people how things are done is a, is a barrier removal project. Because all you have after the job, you spent three, four years doing it, spent, you know, potentially 500,000 euros at the weir mitigation removal. And all you have is a real piece of river. Got nothing to show for it. It just looks natural while well, you've removed the structure. But this is the best option. As you can see here, this is an example from Tipperary. Culvert problem or a bridge apron problem. Just single span. Problem's gone. Awesome. And this is happening all over Europe. This is Dam Removal Europe. It's a good website. Have a look. Um, you can see that these structures can come out with the right, you know, the, the world won't end. You know, they can be removed and fish passage will improve, you know, hydromorphology will improve. There will be big benefits. You can do breaching, basically cut a chunk out of it. This is upstream of Anacotti and the Mulcair. This is the Mulcair Life Project. This is a good job. Basically left the structure in situ, took a chunk out of the weir. River is now happily flowing through it. Um, when you're down into the fish passage options, this is the preferred option at the moment. It's like a, a weir mitigate when you're not removing the weir, but you're adding extra fish passage to it. I'd be it a culvert or a weir, you can rock ramp. There's a series of steps, rough cut steps that lead up to the, to the, the top of the weir or the, the floor of the bridge acre. And the idea is that it's a very natural answer to a, to a man-made problem. Nature like fish channels basically bypass the structure with a natural river. Um, examples of France and Finland. Um, we don't have any of those in the country at the moment. Um, 
good a good good solution problem is how does the fish find the output of the river is there enough water going down it um and how do they how do the fish moving downstream find it you know it, all the river has to go through this in a dry flow event otherwise the fish will get confused and get trapped in places you don't want them to be and some of the problems that i highlighted earlier would be happening uh, technical fish passage options vertical slot fish pass this is probably the best way if you're going to go technical uh, full depth slot so everybody can make passage through that so no there's no jumping it's just swimming so this is a good this is a good answer uh, pool pass for for if you're dealing with species that have the capacity to jump just a little bit they're getting better all the time so where are we in ireland um national barrier program 2018 to present we created a national database we went around we harassed all these these uh, these bodies they were all very good they gave us a lot of data we com compressed it all into a database and then we created a tool that we can directly assess that database it's based on your phone it's a samsung it's an application survey one two three but three we'll survey one two three by esri and um, it allows us to modify that database in the field with real-time data it's awesome there's no paperwork anymore and my we have regional operatives in ifi out there doing these assessments for us and it's a brilliant tool so what did we find when we put the database together well we identified seventy two thousand potential barriers so they're river crossing structures so as you can see here that's a lot of structures it's a bit of work because every single one of those will need to be ident will need to be viewed and, and looked at and see is it a problem or not and um, so far we've been i've got some numbers later but as you can see here the majority of the problems potential barriers in ireland are actually culverts or bridge aprons our structure spanning rivers so that's probably where most of our river fragmentation is happening the rest of it is like other items uh waterfalls natural structures and weirs but like you know weirs are you know for big ticket items especially if they're really low down in the catchment so how much have we done so far got our seventy three thousand potential barriers well we've looked at 25 almost twenty six thousand probably about now because people are out there doing it right now. Um, 19,500 are classified as not a problem. We've been out there and said, yeah, that's not, a, that's not an issue for fish passage. Um, but 6,300 6, are a potential barrier. They have been identified as a structure of concern and they have to be out there and they have to be assessed. So there's a lot of work out there. And we looked at some of the numbers and when we broke them down, we reckon there's probably about 10,000 barriers to fish passage in the country. However, it's not as grim as that. However, some of those are on such small channels that the cost benefit won't be there to mitigate them. That, that it'll be, the mitigation of those structures will be through time when a county council has to go back and say, you know, on this one meter wide small stream, headwater stream, um, we're gonna have to replace this with a culvert, you know, a box culvert, and that will be mitigation. So that'll be in time. But we've identified structures of interest. And then we have one of the, my things that we need to think about is what happens when there's lack of management in these large structures that are over 150 years old, even older? Well, they fall down and they break. Rivers are dynamic environments and they can, they're very destructive. This is a weir in Formoy. Most people know about it. Um, there was arguments about it. You know, it's, it's fallen down. Fish passage is not a problem anymore. But as I said, there's public benefit that's been lost. So everyone needs to get together and come with a, a solution which is good for everybody. This is the weir on the Camlin in Longford Town. The top rock blocks here, the fish pass are broken. Uh, fish pass has no very little water in it. This is not functioning anymore. This needs to be repaired. Same, another image on the Boyne. Big breach on one weir that's stealing water from the fish pass. The fish pass is being affected. This is a, this is a weir on the Shannon. The bottom baffle is gone on the fish pass. So this is high velocity, shallow water now coming through this structure. So the, the fish pass is very effective because it's, it's been damaged and needs to be repaired for time. So, but there's good news. What happens when you do a weir removal? What happens when you do mitigate a structure? What happens when there is good water quality and there is a healthy population there? How do they respond when you do a weir removal, when you take out a structure? Well, very positively. Good. This is an example of from Denmark. Um, this is trout density on this side. This is 
the, they, they assessed the arrow is when they removed the weir. You can see on both, same on both sides. This is a sampling locations, sampling times. So this is upstream of the weir and then downstream of the weir. You can see they've surveyed over many years. So when they remove the weir upstream of the weir, all of a sudden the river has gone from being a lake to being a river and the trout respond. respond. A lot more youth of the year and older fish all of a sudden. You know, they basically, they fill the habitat that you've created for them. Downstream of the weir, where you'd expect to just to trundle along because there's not really been much change because you've just removed the weir that's affecting the water upstream. All of a sudden, the trout population responds very positively, probably due to more natural sediment conditions and hydromorphology. So it's really a win-win. You get your habitat back upstream and you get your better spawning and better nursery downstream. And a lot of anglers might turn around and say, well, you know, we're losing adult trout water upstream of your weir. And this is what the Danes found. They found that upstream of the weir, the older trout, the numbers actually improved after the weir was removed because there's better habitat for all trout age groups, not just, you know, the adult ones. So like you have this increased number of adult trout upstream and downstream of the weir after the structure has been removed. So it's very, very positive. So for the National Barrier, Crab, Barrier Program over our first four years, yeah, inventory of potential barriers. We have an assessment program that's going on. We've identified, we've assessed 25,000 structures. We've identified 6,300 barriers to fish passage. And we do, we're running concurrent programs. We're looking at future-proofing any mit mitigation against climate change. Anything we do now, we have to be mindful of in the future in terms of the way climate predictions are going, we'll have less water and we'll have more sunshine. We can't afford, we potentially can't afford to have like structures in our rivers that we've mitigated that could affect the fundamental thermal regime of the river in 20 years time. We need to be very mindful. So in a lot of, in some cases, maybe a rock ramp isn't the answer. Maybe removal or breaching would be the only way forward. And we need to highlight this is, you know, we need to highlight legislative shortcomings that's affecting IFI and the job we do in terms of like, say, intake and outtake screening, you know, keeping fish in and out of, keep them out of, you know, turbines. We have no legislation on culvert installation and management, and there's lack of clarity on maintenance responsibilities of fish passes and, uh, you know, uh, you know, fish passage options, you know, so who, you know, what's going on there? So the take home message for, for, for me for a lot of these things is like the people who own these structures must be aware of the potential impact of these structures, not only, a high, not only on the fish, but the hydromorphology and the potential knock on effect of status, WFD status. So that affects us all in terms of, you know, we have to get to good status by 2027, you know, and if, you know, fish passage is being affected and there's no salmon where they should be because there's a big weir in the way, that's a problem. And then climate proofing strategies. I put, I threw this in at the last minute. More natural rivers have, uh, have better resilience and resistance to temperature disturbance and they're both roughing. So basically more natural a river is, the more resist resistant it will be to climate change. You know, and we have to focus on, you know, preserving or reestablish river processes, you know, that create better habitat for fish, but also protect it from climate change. So we know, you know, because stream temperatures are going to go up. But we need to see what we can do to prevent them going up to a point where we're not going to we're not going to have some on it in some places anymore. And my my take home is never underestimate the value of a fence. You put a fence in, you'll have vegetation growing, the trees growing, they'll shade the river, they'll protect it somewhat. So uh, this is still ongoing. The Amber program. If you want to get involved, you go to your the the app store, the I, Apple Store, the, the Barrier Tracker app. It's a really good useful tool. You go on there. And you can report barriers to fish passage. And I have good access to this and I can integrate it with my, uh, my, my database. So it's really useful too. If you're going out there and you're doing assessments, this is the way to go because it will feed directly into me. I can put it into our, our database and it, it, we can move things forward. So any questions? We just leave it at that and thank everybody most sincerely for getting involved and listening and there's a call to action there at the end about the, the AMBER project. So if anyone's interested in getting further involved or getting further information to get in touch, 
Happy well, absolutely. I mean, I would, if you're out on rivers, download the app. There's a structure that you see. You can record it. You can, you know, you, you basically, you can assess it and you set, you can upload it to the, 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 the website. If you look at the Amber, the Amber website, it's Amber International website. You can see there's a, there's a map of Europe and you can see all the, the structures that have been assessed in Ireland. And you can add to that, which is really, it's really nice. And that, that'll feed back to me. Thank you.